without further ado, we're going to jump right in and do the kind of 10,000 foot view of Chill Beams 101. So who is the Danko? Where do they come from? What's their purpose? If you look at the bottom right of your screen, and hopefully you guys can see my cursor flying around here, right down here in the bottom right is a picture of a nozzle. And so if you've heard the word chill beam, you've probably heard the word induction, you've probably heard the word nozzle. This is a pretty good representation of what one of those nozzles look like. And actually, depending on the size of your monitor screen, this is, on mine, this is honestly pretty close to life size. And so that gives you an idea of the fact that we're using a constricted opening to force air through a nozzle, and we'll dive into that much deeper later. But only point that out and put a picture of that on the slide because that's kind of how Dedanko got its start. Uh, you know, using perimeter induction systems that were along the perimeter of a building in Australia, but also in the U.S., you know, those things have been installed 30, 40, 50 years ago inside a lot of government-style high-rise buildings. Universities have a lot and dormitories, believe it or not. So if you've ever seen a hydronic coil along the perimeter behind an, ex behind an enclosure, that's, you know, might have been a perimeter induction unit. And really what chill beams are is taking that hydronic coil that was traditionally along the perimeter on the, at the floor level behind an enclosure, taking the coil out, sticking it in the ceiling because it has nozzles, it has a coil. We put a sheet metal case around it, and that's what well, that's what a chill beam is. That same technology. So back in the mid '90s, uh, Danko started replacing the nozzles that were inside all the perimeter induction units, and that bridged into making perimeter induction units, bridged into making overhead chill beams, and then of course, being an Australian company, they kind of foresaw the chill beam boom that was possibly happening in North America and wanted to do business in North America. Tricky thing for a you know, a, a company manufacturing not in the U.S. is finding a good rep network, a good distribution network, and that's where this joint venture with Meztech came from. So Meztech's company has been around for decades, located in Westfield, Massachusetts, doing a lot of hydronic style system companies. They own, you know, 40 small niche companies, and a majority of those are hydronics based. So in 2012, Meztech bought Didanko. So since 2007, Anything that has Dodenko's name on it has all come from Westfield, and since 2012, it's been owned by Nestec. All the manufacturing, engineering, support, everything. So the nice thing is along with that, in Westfield, Massachusetts, is also Dodenko's training center. And the reason this thing is, is kind of a cool spot to come and look at, because the next slides I'm going to show you give you pictures of actual showcase rooms and demonstration areas inside this training center. But it does a couple things. One, if you are a little bit unfamiliar with chilled beams, it'll give you an idea of what one looks like in the ceiling. And secondly, the nice thing is it's also going to give you some idea of different application types that you might look at and think about using chilled beams. Because these demonstration spaces are really you know, giving you an idea of what spaces we, you know, sometimes I would say the large majority of jobs we see installed in are in, you're going to see office buildings, or I'm sorry, you're going to see an office room, office area, a conference room. Uh, the, there's a lab, and actually that's the first picture I want to show you. This is like the first showcase room we'll probably, you would probably visit if you came to Devanko's corporate facility. And this isn't a testing area where we test capacity of beams, where we test, you know, their ability, what GPM is going through the beam. This is actually just an active lab, you could say, with an active lab hood sitting right here. There's another one off to the right side here you can't see. But this represents a laboratory application out in the field that either a private lab, and I would say majority of the cases we see are generally university-style lab. If they're doing, you know, all the colleges of engineering are going to have a lab or two or quite a few labs. And so this was built at the court facility to demonstrate, okay, I'm designing a lab, and I want to know what it's going to look like. And if you haven't seen them before, here are the chilled beams in the ceiling. There's quite a few different rows. These are typically two feet wide. This one happens to be six feet long. And the only important thing to point out is you would never see this many chill beams in a row this close together inside of a space this size. The reason there are that many components in the ceiling is we have two separate systems we're trying to showcase here. System one is just rows one, three, and five. And so if you turn on system one in this laboratory and then you turn on this lab hood and open the sash, we can see how rows one, three, and five interact with this lab hood when you design chilled beams over the tables. That's one layout. So we turn off system one, turn on system two, 
and system two is simply going to turn on rows two and four. So now we can look at a completely different layout and see how the discharge of this chilled beam, which is going to go lateral, how does it affect this wall going down to this table? How does it now, it's a little bit closer to this lab hood. When the discharge comes out, how does it affect this lab hood? So we really spend a little bit of time in this lab talking about how chill beams affect a design layout. In the, all the years I've been designing chill beams, which is, I don't know, 12 or 13, I mean, it's been a while. Uh, laboratories were one of the first, I would say, the largest projects we had, the most projects we had were in labs, basically because labs have a high sensible load, and that's something that chill beams help take care of. And there was high high air change rate requirement. And so the induction principle of the beam, reintroducing air into the space, additional air into the zone, helped with that uh, high air change rate requirement. So that's why we talk about the lab and we've doing we've been doing labs for quite a while. Just down the hall from that lab at the Venclose facility is another example of a chill beam in the ceiling. This one happens to be two feet wide by four feet long. And we start talking about healthcare. So healthcare is a little bit of a you know, in flux application for us because traditionally uh, there weren't, weren't, there were not very many chill beams in patient areas. Uh, ASHRAE 170 required, you know, coils inside of patient areas, required filtration. There were certain system requirements that in the last year and a half or so since ASHRAE 170 code has changed that allows us to now look at doing more chill beams inside patient areas because if you design that healthcare application to be sensible only, and sensible only meaning no condensation, we no longer require filtration inside the unit. So a filter is really what inhibited the performance of the chill beam. And one of the benefits of the chill beam is the fact there are no filter, no fan, no moving parts. It is really a coil inside of the sheet metal box. So the maintenance is very low and you know not worrying about filter changes those benefits. So this is where we, we certainly have had many hospital applications in the past in the administrative areas, you could say general waiting areas, hallways, things like that. But now actually talking designs of patient spaces is something that we've been doing in the recent past. Next to that hospital room at the facility is also a, what looks like a hotel room, which in Europe and where children's kind of originated would be the European area as far as overhead children applications. We don't see a lot of those in North America. But what we do see, and what this room kind of represents, is the single or dual occupant room that college dormitory would be a good example to where we do we see chill beam style units in college dorms? Certainly do. And this room, so we can talk about single and dual occupant living areas, not like a, a single or dual occupant office, because in the office you're simply there during the day. These are a little bit of a different approach because you're actually living there. So also what's interesting about this picture is it starts to showcase the fact that I know the other pictures we've been showing you two foot wide by four and six foot long units. Now you're seeing a unit that only, that's only eight inches wide. It's still four feet long, but it's only eight inches wide as opposed to 12. And so the importance of that is to start, start the discussion understanding of there are many different types and styles of chill beams. And the reason there are is because there are different ceiling types. There are different architectural requirements for ceilings. There are different reflected ceiling plans. And all those things simply mean we need to change that exterior sheet metal housing in that beam to fit with the type of ceiling type that we're designing for a certain system. So in a few slides from now, we're gonna do a kind of an elevated cross cut view of the internal workings of the chill beams. We're gonna start understanding nozzle location, coil location, and the induction principle. So we'll get to that in the future, but the, the key thing is the understanding that there are different types and styles of beams for different ceiling structures. We kind of kicked off the presentation referencing perimeter induction units, and there's one right there along the, the perimeter of this room. Here's the front louvered panel. We induce air through there. There's a coil sitting right behind that louvered panel, and then there's nozzles also back there. And so the induction happens through there, and then this grill on top is where air is gonna be distributed out into the zone, out of the top of the unit. So basically, if you took the coil out of that and stuck it up here in the ceiling, it goes from being called a perimeter induction unit to a chilled beam. So I should also say the word chilled beam is a little bit of a, a misnomer or a misleading name because we also do heating with the chilled beam. So a lot of people started calling them active beams or just kind of referencing them some other way besides the word chilled. I would say in the early days of beams in the U.S., 
maybe 25% of the projects we saw were cooling and heating, and now it's it's 50-50 or, or more are cooling and heating than just cooling only. So it's important also to understand that we do talk a lot about chilled beans in heating mode. There's a few things that come into play there, understanding when you're doing overhead heating. And really, this has nothing to do with chilled beans. It has to do with, it could be the same discussion with your diffuser. Anytime you're doing overhead heating, we just take a little bit of a, a harder look and a better understanding of engineering and systems to make sure we do have good space air distribution, uh, good space comfort, make sure we're heating the occupied zone of the space, which is the, you know, the bottom six feet of the zone. So also inside that corporate facility is a classroom setting. So I would say that the largest two groups that we design for are the school sector and the office sector. So this is a little bit of a different layout. You'll notice we typically may not see three children here's the corner of another beam right here. So you typically wouldn't see three beams in a row like this. The only reason you do in this case is because, again, we're highlighting two systems. There's another, these are not returns. These are actually another device we manufacture called an infuser. And so just like chilled beams are compared to being a fan coil without a fan, that's really what you could say chilled beams are. Infusers are just like a chilled beam, but there's no coil. So basically you have, an, you have a diffuser with nozzles. So we don't talk a lot about that in this presentation. Uh, we do those and we'll, we can, if you have questions, certainly ask and we can get you that info. But I just want to point out a typical application wouldn't be three beams running down the center of the space and four returns sitting like that. It's two different style systems we're trying to showcase here. But here's another look of a basic two feet wide by six foot long active chill beam with the induction happening right here in the center. This perforated panel is where air is being induced from the space. And these two long slots on each side is where the air that's induced mixes with the primary air and then distributes out into the zone in a lateral fashion. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Another space in there is the boardroom or the conference area. The couple of neat things about this room are one, now we're noticing the fact that the beam is no longer installed in a ceiling, either the drop ceiling or the hard ceiling, it's actually installed inside of a cloud. So you can understand, okay, now I understand why there's different types of beams. This one goes in the cloud. The customization done to this beam is the fact that the perf panel on the beam, we match the perf panel of the cloud, or the, I'm sorry, the perf design of the cloud matches the perf design of the beam. So trying to, you know, integrate those two to look very similar. And also what looks like a really long chilled beam is actually multiple beams put end to end. Uh, the longest chilled beam that I think any manufacturer makes, but I know that Tenenko makes, is only 10 feet long. We typically don't see many over eight feet. Uh, so, but you could certainly design systems that would put beams end to end and look like a very long linear, if there's architectural reasons or aesthetic reasons, we'd like to do that. So it's nice to know that. The other important thing about this room is the fact that now we have the discussion of, if you've heard the word active beam or chill beam, you've probably heard the word constant volume because chilled beams are considered to be a constant volume system. But there's always spaces, whether we're doing that office application or that school application, very similar to this boardroom where you say, well, I'd really like to VAV control that space because I either have no one in there for six hours a day and twice I get about 10 people, but I don't want to put constant volume in that space. I'm, a, that's not energy efficient. B, I'm going to overcool. Uh, so I'm really not sure beams are the right spot for this area. And so this is the spot where we stand and talk about, can I VAV control what is typically considered to be a constant volume system? Can I do some VAV con concept with a constant volume chill beam? The answer is yes. And so this is, this is where we start to understand that discussion and kind of that 201 we talked about later or earlier, that's where that you dive deeper into that uh, in that presentation, understanding how to do that VAV concept of the constant volume beam. Here's another example of the office setting. This is just the corporate office there at Bidanko, but the nice thing is there's chill beams out in space that we can talk about. But also, you'll notice, you, if I didn't point it out, you might not have noticed it, but here there are two by four chill beams along all of the perimeter windows. So that's telling me these are definitely cooling and heating. And so we have a little bit of a different layout for beams if they're cooling only than if they were cooling and heating. Because if they are heating, we do need to be cognizant of an exterior wall. That exterior wall, of course, is going to be our biggest heat loss. And so we'd want to understand, you know, the discharge of this beam 
making sure as shown here that it is parallel to the outside wall we would not run this chill beam perpendicular because then the discharge is going to go perpendicular to the outside wall we want to be parallel so the discharge hits that outside wall washes that window comes down the wall and takes care of that heat loss so we can kind of talk about those type of discussions in that room the mechanical room is there also and the other cool thing at the corporate office is the actual testing chamber so if so if you did have and we've done mock-ups in this space many many times for an actual specific application uh, we can heat certain walls to mimic certain outdoor and outdoor air ambient conditions that are different than westfield massachusetts wherever you may be in the u.s we can create artificial heat sources we have modular blocks we've actually built inside of here rooms that match the exact room of the hospital room we're trying to lay out hang different beams at different heights do all kinds of different tests performance tests smoke tests so all those cool things are available back at the corporate office more importantly i just wanted to show you pictures of what beams look like but also give you an idea of what types of applications that we use till beams in quite a bit a couple few things i do want to mention before i go any further we're not going to talk a lot about but other hydronic systems that we do that are just like chill beams are induction displacement systems so this is very similar to the perimeter induction unit there's a coil right behind this louvered panel of this enclosure we induce air in the coil that's right behind this louvered panel and then for induction displacement we deliver along the floor and then secondly here's another picture of that perimeter induction unit here are the difference is this is an open toe kick down here. So air is induced and coming up through this open toe kick, inducing itself through a coil that's right behind this enclosure and then distributing air to the air out of the top. So we won't talk any about those at all in this presentation. I just want to kind of give you an idea. Those systems are very much like overhead chill beams and it's really the same coil. It's just, where's the coil located compared to where the nozzles are located compared to where the primary air is located. That's really the difference between all those different style systems. Also, where they're located, right? Along the perimeter, how do they discharge air, et cetera. So it's a good, good intro, Chris. I'm going to take a pause and let me know if we need to uh, address any questions or keep going. No questions so far. You're good to continue. All right, perfect. So when we think about chill beams, the question generally starts out of why are we here, right? Why are we discussing chill beams? Why did the concept come up? And beyond aesthetics, right? Sometimes, sometimes chill beams are brought into the discussion because of the fact they're very low in height. You know, the, the basic active chill beam is only 10 and a half inches tall. So if you're doing a historical application and you wanted to rehab a building that you can't affect the infrastructure of the building, but you have really low ceiling heights, maybe chill beams come into the discussion then only because of the ceiling height, right? Maybe you have an application where noise is concerned. Chill beams are very, very quiet. And so chill beams came to the discussion because they're very quiet. So there's maybe maintenance, right? You, you, the maintenance is a concern. It would really benefit this owner to have a system that you did not have to maintain as often. And one benefit of chill beams are the reduced maintenance requirement. So there's no fan, no filter, no moving parts. And you, so the basic maintenance is, uh, is dropping down an induction panel and vacuuming a dry coil every two to three, maybe even four years. That's your maintenance. So sometimes chill beams come up in the discussion. A good example would be an adolescent psychiatric care facility, which we've done a few of. You really want to be able to put a component in that zone that doesn't need constant maintenance. So if we had a chill beam, we hung it in the zone, and we put the valve out in the hallway. If you needed to access the valve for maintenance, you was out in the hallway so you did not need to enter the space. Chill beams might have been selected due to the fact that they're very low in maintenance. You don't have to enter the space, but once every few years to access it. So there are special applications and other benefits of beams of why they might come into the discussion. But by far, the largest majority of the jobs and the most, I would say, opportunity they have to, to discuss chill beams with someone is because of efficiencies. The efficiency of the chill beam system and the reduction, right? The reduction on the, the footprint of the building uh, with the, uh, you know, the addition of chill beams. So we've borrowed some information from USGBC here, and the, the important one on this slide is, of course, on the far right. You know, we'll, we'll notice the electrical consumption of, of buildings in the U.S. and how that breaks down. We look at this and notice the entire energy consumption inside the U.S. comparing industry, transportation, buildings of those buildings are the largest energy consumer. And then if we break that building down into electrical, we'll notice. I'm sorry, if we break that energy down into electrical, we'll see comparing the building industry and transportation buildings 
by far is the largest electrical consumer of all those. So if we had the ability to reduce our electrical consumption, increase our efficiencies, that would be a great thing for our building, for our planet, for all those things, right? For the bottom line, for owner-occupied building, for that life cycle cost analysis we all care about. And so how do chill beams, due to the fact they're hydronic, right? Hydronics is water. How is water affecting my electrical consumption? Basically, this one slide, you've probably seen something like this before, is comparing the fact that the, the properties of water, the cooling and heating properties of water are much greater than air. So if we, if we compare BTUs and capacity, in this three quarter inch pipe full of water, you can get the same cooling or heating capacity as it would take to use a 10 by 10 inch duct full of air. And so you can imagine if we transfer some energy from the air over to the water, we now have the ability to do less air to the zone. And less air is a lot of benefits. Now there's one of course threshold that we can't go below and that's our minimum ventilation rate. So whatever our minimum ventilation rate that you know, ASHRAE or local code has told us we must do, a good example would be a classroom for round numbers. We'll say there's 10 students in the classroom and you need 10 CFM per person. For ventilation requirements, that space needs 100 CFM of outdoor air and you can't go below that, right? So that's our kind of our bottom threshold. But typical designs is much higher than that to take care of the space sensible and latent loads. So this is where we like to transfer uh, some of the energy and really what we're doing is we're trading fan energy for pump energy We would like to greatly reduce the fan energy and With only a, an incremental increase in the pump energy and we're able to do that again Kind of like this example of the fact that the cooling and heating properties of water are much greater than air and so if we if we put a hydronic coil in the space run our cooling or heating water through it we can do localized cooling and heating and no longer require all that duty to be handled by our dedicated outdoor air system or our air handling unit. So if you kind of needed a rule of thumb, uh, something to write down and think of what do chill beams actually do for me, they're going to take care of roughly, you could say 50 to 60% of the space sensible load. That's really what they're going to be doing. And so that duty, the 50% of the space sensible load requirement is not no longer required to be handled by your DUAS or your air handling system. So we can use less air to the space because we're going to do localized cooling and heating. Less air, another benefit, is smaller ductwork, right? We still have the same duct run, we still have the same length, but it's smaller ductwork. And so if the average height of a chill beam is only 10 and a half inches tall, we could say inside of 10 and a half inches, you can do all of your heating, ventilating, and cooling. And so your interstitial space between floors now doesn't need to be as much, right? So you've reduced the interstitial space requirement between floors. You reduce your duct size and less air could also possibly result in less air handling, less dedicated air system size. But the biggest benefit by far is the reduction of the fan horsepower consumption due to the fact that we're having to use or we're having to push less air around the building, right? We're doing it with an incremental pump energy increase to transfer water around. Uh, and greatly reducing the fan horsepower consumption. And that's really, at the end of the day, uh, what chill beams are doing for us and why the, why the energy efficiencies of a hydronic system affect your electrical consumption. Because you're reducing your electrical consumption, your air pushing around the building because we're doing some localized cooling and heating with water. There's other periodicals and information out there for you we can pass along. I do want to mention the fact that if you've heard of chill beams, you've probably heard of passive beams. Very, very, very small percentage of projects we work on have passive beams on them, but it's important to point them out and explain them a little bit so we know what they are. So passive beams have two water connections, a water supply and a water return, and the top cavity, you can kind of see those hanging brackets up there. Below those hanging brackets is simply the coil. There's no, uh, you know, there's no sheet metal on the top of this unit because passive beams only work through convection. So I'm going to put through a couple slides there, which are unimportant at this point. But here's the coil we talked about, entering and leaving water, going in and out of this coil. But the top of this passive beam is completely wide open. Purpose and reason is, you heard of the fact, you know, when you hear chill beams, you hear induction. Passive chill beams do not work with induction. There's no nozzle at all inside the passive beam. We're working only with convection. So as warm air warms, I'm sorry, as room air warms up, it rises, just like all warm air does. It rises, and then we have a coil inside the ceiling. 
and this is cooling only because obviously if we did convection heating heat would keep rising this is why we only use heat, uh, passive beams for cooling applications but an important thing to point out here is i've probably said the word sensible only a couple times in the, in the discussion so far both the passive and active beam are, are designed for sensible only cooling the active tool beam we can do some different things with we'll talk about later but the passive beam is always sensible only so how do we keep a cooling coil sensible only because we've probably we've probably all designed an, an air handling an air handling unit before no there's a coil in it coil got drained pan i got to worry about you know my condensate piping my trap height all that type of stuff all that stuff goes out the window because we're talking sensible only cooling the way we stay sensible only is because we stay above the space dew point with our entering water temperatures and so if we typically have a space we've designed i'd say a normal design point is 75 degrees 50 percent relative humidity that's a 55 degree dew point if we keep our entering water temperature above that 55 degree dew point then we don't have to worry about condensation there will be none right and so that's the it's an important thing to understand that we will have an elevated entering water temperature for cooling and we don't want the 45 degree of water that the campus loop is giving us or that the chiller is providing we do still need to create that chilled water temperature because it still needs to go to the doas to do dehumidification but we want about an a entering water temperature around say 56 and generally 57 degrees is what we typically see as an entering water temperature for cooling chilled beams that's true for both passive and active so if we know if our space dew point is 55 our entering water temperature is 57 we're above the dew point we'll never condense and so that's how these passive beams work. I mentioned the fact there's no duct connection at all. You'll notice this is showing you an underfloor system. It's not required to be underfloor to team up with passive beams. That's just the one shown here in this slide. The important thing to understand is the fact that you do have to have a separate primary air distribution system because again, there's no duct connection here. All the only thing passive beams are doing is providing you additional sensible cooling without the requirement of air. There's no nozzles, there's no air, there's no induction. You simply, with a 57 degree entering water temp here in this coil, 75 degree air will naturally convect itself through due to just the, the temperature differences, and then you will have cool air dropping out of the passive beam. So if, you, if you're keeping notes on passive beams, what are they doing for me? They're providing you roughly three to 400 BTUs per linear foot. That's really what passive chill beams do. And they come in similar sizes as the active beams as far as two, four, six, eight, maybe 10 foot long. But they're simply just providing you about three to 400 BTUs of sensible cooling per linear foot. That's what passive beams are doing. We're kind of spending the rest of our time. There's, uh, there's some exposed applications. This is a European picture because there's lighting included. We don't do that in North America very much or, or ever actually. Uh, certainly available, just no one's interested in it but also ones that are recessed behind there would be a perf panel installed inside this t-grid once once the installation was complete so either one recessed or or exposed is perfectly fine on passive beams true for active also but i want to spend the rest of the discussion talking about active chill beams so a couple different decision notes here from what we were looking at earlier you'll notice now we have four pipes the other one only had two so we have the opportunity to do cooling and heating we can also do two pipe heating if we incorporated six-way valves you know we could do four pipes throughout the building for our cooling supply return heating supply return go into a six-way valve and then distribute two pipes only to the beam and you know if, if you understand six-way valves right just do cooling or heating with two pipes at the beam just makes for a more energy efficient system and beam layout but that that's another difference now we can do cooling and heating with the active beams the top of the beam is now closed off because we want to create a sealed plenum and now you'll notice here we got a duct connection and so really active chill beams kind of take the place of your space diffuser if you typically go back to that old classroom example we talked about a 10 cfm per person 10 people in the space we need 100 cfm of ventilation air instead of sending that 100 cfm of ventilation air to your diffusers you're now going to send it to an active chill beam and i think now is a good time to jump to this slide right here so, so what's the purpose of that and why why do we need that to happen? Here's why. And here's how the active chill beam works. We talked about earlier the passive beam of this top plenum being open so air could convect in. The active chill beam, it must be sealed because inside of this plenum will have pressure. Where's the pressure comes from? 
where does the pressure come from? It comes from this primary air that's coming down the duct right here from our probably a dead out of the way air system, air handling system, whatever's delivering the primary and ventilation air to the space. It's going to be coming down the duct with some type of air pressure. Another nice thing about beams are they're not a really high pressure system. Typical layout, see beam pressure around four tenths, maybe five tenths an inch of, of pressure. And that's, that's, you know, that's very reasonable. So with, you know, four or five tenths an inch of pressure coming into the ducted opening here, it will pressurize this plenum. Now, once the plenum's full, the air would love to exit. And so where is the air going to exit? If you remember that first slide, that picture, that nozzle we referenced in the bottom right corner, there's going to be a row of nozzles right here and a row of nozzles right here. And not a single nozzle. It kind of looks like a single nozzle right now. But imagine an entire row of nozzles. For example, if you have a four-foot long chilled beam, you probably remember some of those earlier pictures showed you four-foot long slats or openings on each side where our discharge air came out. Well, that entire four foot long opening will have nozzles behind it. So for a, a four foot long beam, you may have 20 nozzles on each side. You may have 18, you may have 28. The selection software decides all that for us to give us the most energy efficient answer as possible. Uh, using the nozzles to get as much capacity out of the coil as we can, therefore requiring the least amount of primary air, which is really the benefit of the system. So with no fan, no electrical connection, no fan, how does this chill beam work? Here's how it works. Half, say four or five tenths inch of pressure comes into this top plenum. Once it's full, it starts to exit out of the nozzles. So as it's exiting out of the nozzles, one key thing to notice is here's the discharge path of the primary air. It is not going through this coil right here. The only air at all going through this coil is this induced air, this room air that's just hovering below the coil. We talked earlier about the passive beam of the space being 75. As it heats up, it may be 76, 77 at the ceiling. Same thing here. Your space is probably 75. This on the left and right just represent a basic T-bar ceiling. It got up to, say, 77 degrees, and here's our still our same 57-degree coil. We still want to be above square space dew point, but, but this happens due to the fact that, uh, I should also mention we were kind of talking about primary air, the fact that this primary does not go through the coil, meaning all of your space dehumidification is taken care of by this primary air. It comes down the duct, fills the splenum, all our dehumidification capabilities comes right through the beam. It's really just a pass through. It does not touch the active chill beam coil. The primary air simply passes through the unit, goes down into the space, does its dehumidification on its own. The reason it must go through the beam is that's the pressure and the function we're using to create our induction. So as air goes through this constricted opening, it creates a velocity and a pressure. This positive pressure and the velocity starts to create a negative pressure zone right behind this coil. So what happens with negative pressure? The air below this coil comes through to fill that negative, right? So that's how the air is induced through the coil without the need for a fan to do that work for us. So the really nice thing and really cool thing about a chill beam is these numbers here. It says one part primary air and three to four parts room air, simply meaning one CFM goes in here, three to four CFM is drawn through the coil. So for our example, 100 CFM comes in here, three or 400 CFM is induced through the coil. Once that 100 mixes with our three or 400, you have four to 500 CFM of conditioned air going down to the space only 100 had to, cam, had to come from a fan-powered device. That's the, the big ta-da moment, or okay, yeah, oh, now that's, that's what's making sense to me, of how, how a hydronic system has an impact on my electrical consumption back in my dedicated wear system and the reduction in fan horsepower, right? Because this one component is going to deliver four to 500 CFM of conditioned air due to our induction principle, with only requiring 100 CFM of that to come from a fan-powered you know, electrical consuming device. This is all happening through induction. The, the replacement of air into this negative void by the pressure and velocity we're creating with the primary air. Again, the nice thing is that when, when, you, when you think of pressure and velocity, you're thinking, man, I bet it's got to force through the air pretty quickly. It's going to be loud. That's the best thing. It's not at all, right? Beams are sometimes selected because they're extremely quiet. The size, the shape, and you'll notice, uh, and if you noticed on that beginning slide, there's one coming up in a second too. You know, the shape of the nozzle is is engineered so that air can go through the nozzle opening and do and, and do as much capacity at the lowest noise levels, 
creating more induction. So there's engineering behind all the nozzle technology, which is really good. And so this is how the chill beam works. And so if you grabbed a Bidenko catalog and flip through it, you'd probably notice there's 10, probably around 10 basic different models. Now we do custom beams all the time, right? So we would never have a catalog big enough to show you all the custom opportunities. But if you just look at basic models, there's roughly around 10 of them. And, and if you understand this one slide and this one principle, you understand all 10 of those chill beams, basically because they are, there's different orientations of where the coil is. This coil is horizontal. Maybe I want to turn the coil vertical and go above the ceiling. Instead of having the coil horizontal, I want to turn it vertical. And when you do that, you start to induce space, or I'm sorry, you start to induce plenum air, and the nozzles are in a different location only because we have a different ceiling type. Maybe there's a bulkhead around the cafeteria area and you don't have a ceiling. The bulkhead, you can put chill beams in, but they wouldn't look like this, of course, right? We'd still have the same nozzle and coil, but they would just be oriented differently with a little bit of a different sheet metal housing to, uh, you know, to be able to put you inside an opportunity to put a beam inside a bulkhead. Maybe an area doesn't have a ceiling. So maybe you've done, uh, we've done quite a few applications and you've probably heard the word Kwanda wing, right? Because we want to, as this picture is showing you right here, I'll actually go to the next slide to get a better idea of what the air distribution looks like. We do want warm air to rise and we want to induce it through the coil. We want it to mix and then we want air to go lateral throughout the zone, throughout both these beams. You'll notice our air is going lateral, not coming right out and dumping. We don't want air to discharge out of the beam and dump. And so if you've heard the term Kawanda effect before, that's not necessarily a chill beam term. That's just uh, anything that's in an adjacent structure. You'd have the same discussion with a diffuser. And the intention and purpose for that is saying that, that air that comes out of a structure, and this is, we're trying to get this to go horizontal and not dump. If there's a structure next to it, so this happens to be a ceiling, right? The air will go out and it will drive and it will hug that ceiling and go lateral until the until the velocity there does just happen to have it drop off. So we want both of these to come out and go lateral. And the purpose for that is good air distribution and space comfort. We don't want this beam on the left to come out and drop straight down. This beam on the right to come out and drop straight down. Then you've got a big void in the center. One of the big benefits of chill beams are space and space uh, air distribution and occupancy comfort. The reason for that is the fact that this induction principle is not connected to temperature whatsoever. And I guess I think there's some designs that think, well, I've got my space set at 75, and when my when my thermostat says 75 and satisfied, I no longer get air distribution. Completely opposite with chill beams, because this induction principle is not connected to temperature whatsoever. It's connected to pressure. So let's say for that example, you've got a space mounted thermostat. It wants to be 75. It is 75 degrees, so your valve turns off. The valve that's the water valve that's providing water flow to this coil, it turns off because you no longer need cooling, but you still have occupancy. We still have those full classroom full of students or the full office full of employees. So that means I still need ventilation air. So if I still need ventilation air, I still have 100 CFM coming into this duct. I still got a half inch of pressure creating velocity. I still have air being induced. So I'm still getting four to 500 CFM of nice conditioned air distributing throughout the zone, even though my valve is turned off which is, again, no additional fan horsepower required. So space and occupant comfort is, is, happens all the time with uh, chill beams, and that's kind of one of the nice benefits. Chris, I want to take a quick break here at about 40 after and see if we need to address anything. Yeah, so I do have one question. Uh, just uh, wanting to get a quick 10,000-foot view of what a six-way valve is and the advantages of using ah. that. So you betcha. Let me, and I'm just going to break out of the presentation for a minute because this this presentation i think we've gotten to almost 40 slides every day in this presentation about 150 slides long because there's things like this in there so there's a six-way valve right there so how a six-way valve works so hopefully you can, i believe you guys see this cursor you could imagine we have a four pipe system going throughout the building chilled water return chilled water supply hot water return hot water supply but I want to be able to use the, the coil inside the beam for all cooling or all heating, depending on cooling or heating seasons. So how that happens is here would be, uh, top left is going to be entering chilled water. On the right side is going to be entering hot water. Bottom left is leaving chilled water. 
bottom right is leaving hot water. The one in the center here, that's going to be your, your supply temp to your chilled bean, whether it's angled to the cooling side or angled to the heating side, the valve and the actuator uh, uh, do that for us, right? So this would be our, our, it wouldn't be chilled in hot water, it would just be our water supply to the bean coming out of the top. And then in the bottom is going to be our water return. And so, oops, I hit a button, sorry about that. I don't think any of these pictures do a better job of describing, except for you can see here, um, you know, cool water comes in, goes to the beam, cool water goes through the beam and then comes back, back to the cooling side of the system. Here's the opposite side of the valve. Hot water comes in and the valve, the actuator shifted the valve opening to open hot, let hot water into the beam. Now you'll see, now you're cycling hot water through the beam, and hot water returns. And this way you can kind of do, you could certainly do simultaneous heating and cooling throughout your building, right? Maybe the perimeter needs heat in the wintertime and the core needs cooling. So you have a very large facility and the, the, the core and center of the building always need cooling. Here you could do four pipes. And the benefit of this, and the reason this is beneficial, is because, I'm going to go back to another picture here and explain. And we, actually, Chris is a nurse. We haven't done this yet in the presentations. Um, I want to talk about the actual coil inside the active beam. This is probably the best picture. So you will notice, here's a supply connection. Here's a return connection. So whether you're doing cooling and heating, this is always the same coil inside the beam. It's not that uh, when we do heating, we add a third row and we don't add an ancillary coil, we don't add another coil. If we wanted to do cooling and heating, what we'd have to do is you'll notice, again, this two row coil and there's eight tubes in each row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight times two is 16. So there's 16 tubes in this coil. Right now, we enter through one tube, it goes back and forth 16 times and, lead and exits. So this is a single circuit coil. If we wanted to do cooling and heating, we don't, again, add a third row. We don't do anything. Else. And this is true for all manufacturers. No one really does that because it's an air pressure and induction principle. So what we have to do, if we want to do four pipe cooling and heating, we have to rob four of these tubes and do a separate four tube heating circuit. So what in essence, what used to be a 16 tube cooling circuit is now reduced to 12 tube cooling circuit because we need a four tube heating circuit. And those two, you know, those two never mix. That is one drawback or one reason you could not use a six way valve if you had some treatment in your water. Let's say you treated the, the hot water, you treated the chilled water, they don't have the same water treatments, you couldn't use them because a six way valve is not a blending or a mixing valve, but the water that's sitting in the beam, when you switch from cold to hot, it will, you know, it'll drain out, right? If you have chilled water went through the beam and the valve closed, you have the chilled water liquid in the beam and then it switched to hot, whatever's sitting in the beam will drain out the hot side. So that's why if you had a treatment, you couldn't use it. But if you're using the same uh, properties in chilled and hot water, you can use a six-way valve. And what that allows you to do is instead of going to now a dual-circuited 12 tube cooling and four tube heating, you can do a 16 tube cooling and 16 tube heating. So it, it greatly improves your efficiency of your cooling side and also, of course, your heating side. And so that's really the, the benefit. And I'll be honest with you, six way valves reminded me of, you know, 15 years ago designing dedicated outdoor air systems. Whenever from fan VFDs, you know, kind of first hit the market, those things were very, very expensive. Uh, it had to be, you know, when they first came out, it just had to be a special application to use them because they were very expensive. And nowadays, they become so cheap, you just throw fan VFDs on to balance your fans. You know, that makes that easy. Six-way valves are very similar. When they first came out, very few manufacturers doing them. Uh, they were very expensive. But now they've gotten to the point, multiple manufacturers make them, and they're cheaper. And so now they become comparable in price once you look at installing. If you're doing, you know, a, a four pipe cooling and heating system you have multiple maybe three-way valves you kind of get rid of all those and do a single six-way and so it's really you could say equal or comparable in price to the four-way system so that, that's really the purpose of doing a six-way valve and how it benefits your system so hopefully i got that all answered i didn't chris jump in but i think we're good to go um, i do have one more question for you yep yeah let's do it uh with the new environment how are we managing cleaning the coil uh, do we have we considered using latent? I'm sorry, excuse me. Have we considered using uh, ultraviolet? So that question actually that's interesting because that came in to me earlier this week on another application where someone was thinking about using UV light 
on a coil. And so I think, I've, so I looked into it myself. I've never seen it ever on a previous chilling job. Checked with Chris, the engineers at the Danko. They had never seen it. Uh, I've never seen it on any other project by any other manufacturer of the chill beans. And I think the reason is when I, again, think back to those old days of designing dead cat door systems, when we were putting UV lights on cooling coils, exposure is a big no, no, right. For UV light. And so anytime you would have UV light on, uh, there would need to be door switches or any, any type of device that would make sure if a door was open and a UV light was behind it, the UV would be immediately shut off. You'd be alerted there was UV on. And so I don't think UV is going to be capable of being used on beams because beams are exposed to the space, right? Exposed to where the occupants are. And so if you looked up, let me go back to a couple of pictures here. Um, so you can you can understand with this picture here that the coil, excuse me, is sitting right behind this perforated panel. And so if we go back to some of our pictures, we were looking at active beams. Um, you will notice, hold on, we're almost there. So you will notice, here's the perf panel, right? So the coil is sitting right behind that panel. So to get UV, and especially UV was always used, right, for condensing coils. The fact we're never condensing, I don't think is going to give us any reason to think about doing UV here because that's, that's, you know, we never put, really put UV on heating coils inside air handlers. You know why? Because, because heating coils were sensible only. There was no condensation. There's nothing growing on that coil. We always put UV on the cooling coils. Why do we do that? Because they were condensing. The active chill beam is typically designed not to condense. And so if there's no condensation happening, uh, I don't think there's going to be a need for UV, but also exposure is going to be a big problem because right behind this perf panel is the coil. And so to get you know, you wouldn't necessarily need UV on the on the entering side of the coil, right? You generally typically do on the leading side, or it could be upstream, doesn't matter. But either way, uh, you know, the fins per inch on this coil are relatively liberal. They're not packed in there tied at 14 fins per inch. You know, there is space. So ultraviolet light, if it wasn't a downstream side, let's go back to that one picture we were just looking at just now. So if we put UV um, on the back side of this coil, it certainly could see through the fins see through that perf no doubt right because this perf is only 50 percent free area so half of it's open and so if we put uv behind it it's getting down in the space uv below it it's getting down to the space and we're not convinced so i think the uv is out but this reminds me of uh 10 12 years ago doing when we started thinking about doing hospital applications where they did cleaning was a concern and so they wanted to be able to clean and the place where they wanted to clean was the coil and they wanted to clean not only let me go in town to a picture where we talk about maintenance right here. This is our maintenance slide. And we talk about the fact that there's no filter, no fan, no moving parts. Once every two to three years, this says four. Once every two to three years, you open this perf panel and vacuum a dry coil. And that's really the maintenance because that's very accessible. Healthcare, uh, about 10 years ago, thought about being able to, to clean both sides of the coil. So there are a couple applications uh, looking for being able to access the back side of the coil, uh, kind of a removable coil. So I don't know if that might be something in the future, but I I haven't heard anything myself besides the fact that UVs now come up twice this week. Uh, but I, I don't think we'll have to think about that one more if it's really required with a non-condensing situation. That's kind of, I think, the, the prelim thought on that. Um, Chris, any more questions? Good to go. Good to go. Sound like Okay, all right. So just to touch on this real quick, because it is a very big important point of chill beams, occupant comfort and space distribution of air is wonderful because this is happening at all times. When your thermostat's happy, this air is happening. Whenever your thermostat's on, this air is happening because you have ventilation and you have air moving throughout the zone. So here's a picture of that nozzle we talked about. You'll notice there's a different shape to this nozzle. The intention of that is creating that pressure, that velocity, but increasing the surface area of the air that's being forced through it. And the increased surface area allows us to get a longer discharge, therefore higher capacity, therefore more induction at a lower noise level. And so again, we talked about earlier about why did we select beams? It's typically because they're very energy efficient. Sometimes it's because they're very quiet. I can think of applications like a courtroom, uh, or sorry, courthouse, because we typically, of all the courthouse applications we've done, I don't think we have any chill beams in the actual courtroom. And that's only because I think two reasons, aesthetics and the, and the ceiling height of the courtroom. 
we certainly have courthouse applications with, you know, jury deliberation rooms, juror chambers, judicial chambers, waiting rooms with chill beams. But this is a good time to stop and talk about where would we put chill beams when ceiling heights become a question. So that, the great example is the courtroom, right? The courthouse. Do we do courthouses? Yes. Do we put them in courtrooms? No. So is a good chill beam application one that has to have beams everywhere? Absolutely not. I mean, there's very few jobs I work on that are called chill beam jobs that only and solely have chill beams and that's it. Very few because a good designer is only going to put chill beams where they make sense. So a couple places where they don't make sense are going to be that courtroom, right? The ceiling is very tall. Why are tall ceilings an issue is because we want to make sure whenever we're doing our air distribution that if we have an occupied zone of the bottom six feet, we want to make sure our cooling heat is getting down to that bottom six feet. If it doesn't, it's a useless design. And so if we're doing cooling only, we typically see, see chill beams 12 to 14 feet from the floor, and we know our cool air that's coming out of the beam will make it down inside the zone. It will then reheat, and you'll have this type of air pattern. If we're doing heating, uh, you could imagine heat rises. And so whenever we're doing overhead heat, again, this is a diffuser discussion just like a chill beam discussion, not, not solely just chill beams. We want to make sure uh, we don't go up to 16 feet for heating for no reason. We typically see them, you know, around 12 feet. Anything above 12 feet, we like to look at, take a double check. But anything up to 12 feet with heating is typically works out okay. Uh, because just like we talked earlier, we want an elevated chilled water entering temperature. We also want a lower hot water temperature. We, we don't want to see the 180 degree hot water that your boiler is creating for your other heating devices throughout the building because 180 degrees inside this coil does create very buoyant air, right? And it will hug the ceiling. So we typically see something around 110, maybe 120. You know, our software even limits out at 140. You want to go above that. But I don't see too many at 140 for overhead beams. We're typically 110, 120. And we know then if our, you know, our space in the winter is probably 70, not 75, right? Our 70 degree air is drawn through a 110 degree coil. It distributes out. And we want to make sure the height of that beam is of a height that will allow the discharge to get down inside the occupied zone. We don't want to put a heating beam at 20 feet. It'll work, but it'll heat 10 feet from the floor. Not going to do anybody any kind of benefit at all, right? So we want to make sure the discharge works. So if you're doing a cooling only application, up to 14 feet, no problem. And we could go higher if we take a, a double engineered look at it. And heating, typically no higher than 12 feet. And again, we'd look at it if it was any more than that. So, build, so that's why whenever you're doing a chill beam application, you think, well, I've got a courtroom. I can't put beams in. I just can't do a beam job. Well, sure you could. We're just not going to put them in the courtroom. For the school application, which we do a bunch of schools. I mean, a bunch of schools. But you'll never see them in the gymnasium. Why? The gymnasium ceiling obviously is going to be too tall. But secondly, there's a pretty high latent load inside that zone. And we're doing only sensible cooling. And the amount of dehumidification you'll have to do in the gym, uh, the amount of air that's going to be required to send to the gym to take care of the latent load is going to take care of the sensible load at, at the same time. It's easily going to conquer the sensible load. It's working double time just to get the latent load taken care of. So what we don't want to do, and as good designers, we should never do, especially as manufacturers at Thanko or any chill manufacturer, you never want to put chill beams in a zone where the valve never opens. And you just paid a lot of money to have a pretty expensive and pretty diffuser. We like to avoid those situations. So when you are designing a school, you know, we won't, we do a lot of classrooms, we do a lot of hallways, we do a lot of offices. What we don't do, we don't do gymnasiums very, we don't, we don't see them in bathrooms, right? Even if you're doing an office, we're never going to do a chill beam in a bathroom. Why? Because you like to exhaust the air of a bathroom. You don't want to induce and reintroduce into that same zone. So there's areas where we look at and we say, you know what, uh, let's put a fan coil there. Maybe the front foyer of the building, you know, the doors are opening and closing all day long. You have no control over the infiltration of that area. You say, not a good idea for beams because I'm keeping my beams sensible only, throw a fan coil in that zone, and move on. And so it's very important to understand that, sure, beams can make sense in areas, and they don't make sense in others. And, and there's a couple slides I want to finish on, even though there's a bunch. I just want to finish on a couple slides. Lead's very important. If it is for you guys, we can help you find lead points. I'm going to skip to these two slides. So there are certainly designs that favor chill beams and the ones that do not favor chill beams. Just because they don't favor chill beams means we shouldn't do them. It means we need to sit down and have a discussion about it. But here are applications 
you may run into and think, oh, that might be one to look at chill beams with. So zones with moderate to high sensible load densities, that's kind of where chill beams come in. Sensible load, cooling, heating, roughly 50% of the space sensible load taken care of by the beam, no longer by the DOAS, very energy efficient answer. We've also kind of discussed the space constraints. Maybe you have low ceiling heights and you need to add in some cooling and you need to add in some cooling and heating. That's really how kind of chill beams started, right? Putting them in areas that had low ceilings that had no cooling originally. originally. Old classrooms in the north, right? That, that reminds me of that. My elementary school when I was a kid didn't have, any, didn't have any AC. I don't think a lot of them, some still don't have AC in the northern U.S. But you, if you want to go in and add doing a rehab when you can't change, don't have any money to change the building height, right? What can you do? So space constraints work. Zones, acoustical environments, libraries, offices, certainly are great areas for beams because they're very quiet. I know Chris was working on one all a year ago that he had to increase, he had to change the beam design because they were too quiet. Uh, it was an acoustical environment where we, they needed a little bit of background noise from something, and so he needed to increase the, the sound of the beam, not reduce it. So buildings that need significant reheat, beams are good there. Laboratories, we've already talked about that, right? Labs have high sensible loads, higher change rate requirements. But I also want to spend uh, my last slide talking about ones that are less favorable. So these are ones that we wouldn't just say no to, but ones we might think of twice about. Operable windows, leaked construction, therefore we have no idea what the building envelope is like. We talk about building pressurization in those discussions. The low sensible load density, that's that discussion of uh, I don't want to have pay for a pretty expensive diffuser that has no valve that ever opens. That's what would happen at low sensible load. Um, high filtration rates. Filters don't want real old beams. High latent loads, that's that example we talked about of having to send so much air to the space, take care of the latent, and take care of the sensible at the same time. Um, but but I just, that's what I kind of leave you guys with, is understanding that their beam jobs are, are applications that lend themselves toward beams, ones that don't. And it'd be our jobs to help uh, explain those and point those out to you. So, Christian, we're, we're out here. We're, we're here for an hour. Uh, thank everybody for the time. And I just wanted to give one last opportunity to see if there's any more questions. Chris, what do you think? Uh, no, we're all set. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for their time, and I really do appreciate it, the fact that we wanted to do one of these and had to do three of them due to all the interest. So uh, thank you guys again. And if you have any questions, please feel free. I will, one last time for a second, if you're still here, uh, throw this up if needed. You guys can always contact your local rep if you have questions, but Chris and I are always available. So thank you very much, and that is it. Thank you.